Welcome to Mocha Girls Pit Stop TV. I'm your host, Terry Lomax. And today on the show, we have a special guest. If I had to describe her in one word, that word would be resilient. Nellie Cooks is a 26-year-old Chicago native who has overcome some of the most unthinkable obstacles. Despite what Nellie has been through, she was able to get her bachelor's degree from Trinity Christian College in psychology and education studies. She's created an inspiring blog called The Lost Cries, where she shared, shares her story of overcoming adversity. And we are so lucky to have her on the show today. Welcome to the show, Nellie. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. So Nellie, can you just start off by kind of telling us why you're a Mocha Girl on the Mission? On the Mocha Girls Pit Stop blog, you know, we have an initiative called Mocha Girls on a Mission, which is where we celebrate women who have overcome adversity and who are now living dynamically in spite of what they've been through. So can you just tell us, give us a little snippet on why you are a Mocha Girl on a Mission? All right. Well, I am a Mocha Girl on a Mission because I have come through some tremendous obstacles um, that I'm still standing here today. Like, I've been able to go back and help others. Um, I've started two actual initiatives for the community. And despite what I was going through, despite, you know, what I tried, had to overcome, I was able to still be here. You know, God didn't let me take myself out. He used it for a bigger purpose. So that's why I'm a mocha girl on a mission. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. So, Nelly, I did a little research, of course, and I saw, I'm going to read this little snippet that I found on your blog. There was a post called The Gift of Brokenness. And oh. you, yes, it was awesome. It was very, very awesome. And you wrote in that post, as a child struggling with issues, I never imagined my pain would be anything more than scars. You could not get me to believe that there was a positivity that would come from me being broken and wounded. Can you just talk a little bit about your upbringing, what happened when you were a child, how your parents kind of fit into that situation? Sure. Um, of course, my mom didn't have me until she was almost 40. So by that time, you know, she was really tired, almost, as I'll put it. Um, but she didn't really have the energy to discipline me and raise me the way that she, she felt like she needed to. Um, and at that point, I was young. I didn't have friends. I found myself hanging with my brother a lot. Um, and I was just struggling to actually find myself and find someone else that would love me and accept me for me. But I always felt like the black sheep, even though it may have been in my mind, it may have just been my thought process, but I always felt like I was that kid in the background who no one wanted you know, to hang out with, no one wanted to talk to. And it led to me being like very, very secluded. Like I was a very secluded child. Um, I always, I remember just staying in the basement. I would never even come upstairs um, to actually talk to people because I, I was so ashamed and I didn't like me. Oh, so, yeah. And Nelly, where did your where did your dad fit into that picture? Um, my dad has not been around. Um, I never met my real father. Um, I had a stepfather, but I didn't really, there was a time when I tussled with him as well, because I'd never accepted him as my real father. So I struggled with that growing up as well, in which I talk about in one of my blogs, which made me kind of clingy to men. And I would always run to the arms of men for that love factor, for that extra, you know, care and that extra caress because I never knew him. I never grew up with him. I don't even know his name. I don't know where he lives. You know, and my mom always told me, you don't need to know him. You have me. So it was just like, okay, well, you know. So I had to kind of learn a lot of things the hard way in terms of dealing with men. Mm. Girl, that's so deep. I can't even imagine. So, so you wanted to get to know your father. You wanted to learn more about him, but your mom was like, mm-mm. You got me. That's it. How did that like? How did that affect you? Did you ever try to search for him, or do you think it affected your upbringing not having him there? Um, you know what? I did try to search for him, and I think we were even. I remember a day where I was riding in the car with my mom, and we were riding through a neighborhood, and she was like, mm, "That was your dad," but I didn't. I didn't point him out, and I was like, "Oh my goodness! Like, why would you do that to me?" 
but it was just the fact that she felt like he wasn't going to do anything. He didn't have any good to bring into my life. So she kept him away from me and she didn't want to deal with him. Mm -hmm. So she kind of kept us, you know, cut apart. And that tore me up. You know, my pastor now, he kind of had to go through the helping me heal and mending and putting me back together. Because when I came to him, I was this little girl. I was 21, but I was still that six-year-old girl on the outside because I never had a parent to actually parent me as a father mm -hmm. and you know giving me the love and attention that I needed so when he came into my life in 2010 and ever since then you know he's he's dad he's daddy because that's the the dad that I know but yeah it it was that long-term struggle for a parent like a real parent so you're, pa you're talking about your pastor he came into your life in 2010 and he's the father figure that you acknowledge in your life Yes, he is the father figure that I acknowledge now. Um, and he always tells people when he introduces me, this is daughter, but, you know, I could have birthed her. And that's how, you know, close we've gotten since 2010 because he literally took me in and, you know, ra helped raise me in, in terms of my mentality. That is so powerful. Wow. And do you ever, do you, is there still a desire on the inside to find your biological father or learn more about him? Is that there at all? It's there, but it's not there like it was when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, at this point now, I'm just like, okay, God put this man in my life to help me, you know, go where I need to go and to substitute for this person that's not here. So I'm going to accept him for who he is and I'm going to use that, you know, I'm going to take in that love. And I'm just going to go forth. If we find each other, then that's great. But if we don't, there's no longer, you know, that scar that's still open, that's still longing for it. Wow. And I have to ask you, because I, can, I can't even imagine going through. So, I mean, I'm getting a little teary eyed now just thinking about that. And because I know that had to be painful for your mom to experience and her being at a place where she's like, I don't even know. He's not, he's not good enough to be in your life. You know what I mean? But then as a, as a young person feeling that, that piece of you is kind of missing. Mm. Wow. Goodness, that's, that's so deep. So how did you, how did you cope with that growing up? Not having that father figure there? It was tough and I acted out a lot. Um, growing up, I would just keep to myself and that was up until about elementary school. Um, by the time I graduated from eighth grade, you know, my stepfather, he was kind of there in full force, but I still kind of bucked up against it. So with me bucking against it, it kind of rifted me and my mom's relationship as well. Um, so I found myself writing a lot. I still found, I found journals where I've just wrote out whole notebooks just within like a week or two because I had so many bottled up feelings on the inside and I had no one to talk to, like I even, I became a liar. Like I would lie just so people would pay attention to me or they would, you know, deal with me and let me get some of the stuff out. Like I remember I told someone at school that um, my stepfather had raped me and they went and they told their mom. And then next thing I know, DCFS was at my home and my mom was like, why did you do this? But I'm like, nobody is paying attention to me. Nobody is trying to help me. And I was so suicidal. Nobody realized it. I remember um, at around 12, 13, I would sit in my room, Terry. I would take pills. Mm -hmm. And no one would know. I would just sleep. But no one, you know, would come in there to actually see. They would just think, okay, that's just Annette. She's just, you know, crying out for attention. And I would be in there literally like so broken and that I would just keep taking pills just to sleep, just to, you know, relax. And it was tough. It was really hard. And what do you think you needed? Like looking back, being, you know, at a different place now, you're a grown woman now. I'm sure your mentality is totally different from where you were in high school. What do you think that little girl in that room who was taking the pills, trying to sleep, what do you think you needed at that point in your life? I needed someone to tell me about God um, and I needed someone to love me genuinely for who I was 
Um, I needed someone to accept me for what I was. And I was a mess. I was broken. You know, I had feelings as any teenager did that I didn't know how to deal with. And no one had the patience to deal with it. Um, I have three older siblings. They're all way older than me. So that's kind of, you know, the lag. My oldest sister is almost 40 and I'm 26. So you can see like the degree of kind of separation where they were doing their own thing. And here I am, this struggling little girl trying to, you know, pick and choose and find my way. So that I just needed them to embrace me more versus just leaving me where I was. Wow. And do you think those experiences are going to help you when you have children one day? Do you think that like knowing how you struggled as a teenager, that'll kind of help you to be a different kind of mom? You know what? That is always something I think about. Um, and I've shared with my friends, like I'm kind of scared, you know, to have children and parent them, like feeling like I would use some of the principles that I grew up with and, you know, mess them up. I don't want them to grow up the same way that I grew up. So it's just like, I don't, I, <laughs> I kind of stay away from that area of, even though I've been, you know, pregnant before, it's still a tough choice to think about because I'm like, Lord, you would have to lead me seriously if I had children because I wouldn't want them to get the anger and the bitterness that I had on the inside for my mom, you know, in parenting. Because there was no love, you know? There was just something missing that I needed in terms of the softness. And every girl wants that, you know, to be that mama's girl, <laughs> you know, and I didn't have that. I didn't have that at all. So hopefully when I do have children, you know, God will grace me with the love and the wisdom to lead them in the right direction. Wow. And Nelly, you kind of touched on this briefly. I know we talked about this offline. Um, you said that you were pregnant before. Can you kind of talk about that experience and yeah, where you were in your life at that time? And Yeah, um, I've actually had two miscarriages um, and I actually had an abortion as well um, all throughout my teenage years and one in my adulthood. Um, they were all in broken stages of my life. Um, the first miscarriage I had, the guy didn't even know. I was really young. I was scared and no one else knew besides my best friend. And that was because it wasn't supposed to, you know, it wasn't supposed to happen. And the doctors told me it couldn't happen. Mm. So, you know, I never thought that it would, but that was a soul tie and, I was 19 at that time. That was that from about 12 years old until I was about 21. And the guy just, it was horrible. <laughs> and if that's the one word I can describe it, it was horrible. He didn't love me. It was just sex. It was no relationship because he had a clear girlfriend, you know, and that's the type of man that I always attracted and, I always went after, um, and even the guy, you know, the second pregnancy where I had the abortion, the guy pretty much just told me, here's the money, go do it, you know, and he didn't want to go with me. I begged him, I begged him, you know, to go with me, and I begged him to actually keep it because he had three children, you know, mm -hmm. at the time, and I was like, oh, my God, you know, this is crazy. This guy has three children by another woman, and yet he doesn't love me enough for me to keep this one. Mm -hmm. And that hurt me so bad. You know, I went into such a depression after that, and it was kind of like a downfall. I struggled in school throughout you know, my whole college years after that. And then the last one, which was about um, a year and a half ago, um, I was depressed. And I was in a very, very broken state because nothing in my life was going the way that I needed it to go. And it was all a one night thrill. I saw somebody that I used to hang out with. 
he looked at me a certain way, he caressed me a certain way, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I remember that one being like the worst um, in terms of feeling when I woke up and I realized that I lost that child because I actually wanted it and I shared with others that that child was the one that I felt like would heal me. You know, that child was the one I felt like, okay, nobody else understands me or loves me at this point. This child is going to love me. And, it, you know, God let me conceive. And at six weeks, he took it. And that was the worst. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just have to tell you, I am just so blessed by your message and you just being so open and transparent sharing these stories because we don't share this. You know, a lot of women don't talk about these things. They go through, they're embarrassed about sexual partners and about, you know, mistakes they made in the past. And I think that it'll yeah. really liberate young women if we go out and share these stories and let them know, every, you know, it's not all about sexing it up, you know, having a big butt and you know, <laughs> exactly. looking, attracting men. Because that's what, I feel like that's what society is really, is really edifying. These days. So I just commend you yeah. so much for just sharing those, those very difficult situations because we, People really need to hear that. I do want to go back to something you said. You said that you were in a relationship with someone since from, from the age of 12 to 21? Yeah. It was a soul time. Okay. Can you talk <laughs> um, about how you met this man? Like, how old was he? Because that, that's something I was 12 to 21 years old. Yes, 12 to 21. Um, it, was no, it was never, I'll clarify that, never a real relationship as in terms of this is my boyfriend, this is my girlfriend. Um, it was all sexual. I met him at a church that I went to um, a long time ago, and we just hooked up, you know, from there. We started off just talking and hanging out, and then it immediately, you know, our first night together turned into that. And I remember, like, just sitting on the – I didn't know what I was doing. It was 12 years old. Um, you sitting up and you having sex, you losing your virginity – and I just remember, you know, the pain. I just sat on the floor because it was just like, he was 16 at that time. And after we had sex, I sat on the floor and I was just in so much pain. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why I was bleeding. I didn't know what I had just did or what I opened the door to. But at that one time, you know, connected us for all those years, that soul tie, you know, just strung me along. Whenever he called me, I was there. Oh, you want to have sex? Okay, let's do it. Because he was consistent, you know? And that was what I knew. Yeah, he was consistent. <laughs> Versus, you know, if you're in a relationship and you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, they're not always consistent. They're wishy-washy. They're up and down. But I knew when he was going to call. I knew he was going to call. And I knew, you know, we were going to have that time together, even if he did put me out, you know, yeah. after we did whatever, I was still running to him because that was the love that I wanted to feel at that time. So Wow, girl. That is some deep stuff right there. He was consistent. Even though it was consistent in a, in a negative sense, that was something you never had, that consistency, right? Especially to your man. Girl, yeah. my goodness, that's so, that's so powerful. And where was you? Like, what would you tell your mom when you were 12 hanging out with a 16-year-old boy? Like, did she know about him? Did she know he was a friend? Or what, what would you say to her? Um, she knew of him. Um, and at that point in my life, you know, we had a lot of church functions going <laughs> on. So I would just see him at the church function, and we would just go somewhere off, you know. Like, a lot of the time, it would be on those grounds, or it would be like, hey, I'm going to, you know, such and such house, you know, and they're good people in the church. So mm -hmm. it's, it's somebody that you trust. It's somebody that you know. So, okay, she's fine. She's okay. Or there'll be several times where he would just come around and I'd be like, mom, I'm going outside. And we'd just be somewhere in the neighborhood. It was just wherever, wherever he was willing to go, wherever, you know, he was willing to meet is where I was. And she, you know, I think at some point she didn't really kind of pay attention because you probably could have clocked the signs, but she mm -hmm. had a lot, you know, going on. So it was, I didn't bother her. She didn't bother me. 
everything. We were okay. Mm -hmm. so. Um, that's so deep. Did you ever feel like you, like in the beginning when you were young, did you ever feel like you loved that man because he was kind of the only person that you had been with and it had showed you some kind of consistency? Did you ever feel that way? I did. I did love him. Um, I'll say I actually started loving him around the 13 to 14 and I didn't know what it was, but I would see him with other women and I would get angry and I would get so upset and he'd be like, why are you tripping? We just sex her, you know? So it's, it's no big deal. And then I go back into my, which you see how it's just all a big circle. It's like you come out of depression, you, you attach to someone and then they love on you. And then once they love on you, get what they need, they kick you out, you go back to the depression and you come right back around to them over and over again. Wow. So that's what I did from 12 to 21. That just sounds so, I, I can, girl, I'm just like imagining that. That sounds so, like so painful, you know, to keep going through that. I, that's, that's unbelievable. And what would you say to young girls who are out there right now who are going through situations where they're, they kind of don't know who they are and they're looking for that love in all the wrong places and, and really tolerating nonsense. You know, you're, you're lowering their standards. What would you say to them? Because that, that's, that's a lot to experience at such a young age. It's a lot to experience. Um, it, what I would say to them is to really start trying to get to know yourself. Um, the first thing is to get to love you. You have to love the way you look. You have to love the way you talk, the way you walk. You have to love every little nook and cranny about you. You know, I would have times where I would, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, I got hair on my face. I cannot stand this. But, you know, when somebody else comes along like a man that, you know, has no care for you and he says, oh, that's beautiful. I love that. You're like, oh, my God, you like this? Okay, let's hook up. And that's how it happens. So you have to be in a place of contentment with I like me, flaws and all. I don't care. You know, what anybody else says, this is me and this is who God, you know, made me to be. And you don't have to accept, you know, the below standard guy who is just trying to take from you more than what you have to give. You don't have to deal with that. You can find someone. You can meet some. It is possible to meet someone. I mean, you know, you're engaged. You know, to meet someone who loves you just for who you are and is godly and who has God's heart, you know, it, it's real. You can do that. I haven't come to that point, but I do believe that God does have someone there for me. And at this point, you know, he's still shaping me into, you know, that Proverbs 31 that he wants me to be. Girl, you are a freaking rock star. I got you. <laughs> that is, you just dropping so much knowledge right now, seriously. So Nelly, what would you say you look for in a relationship now at this point in your life, having been through all the crazies and all that nonsense? What do you look for now in a relationship? What standards have you set? Um, I'm over the tall, dark, and handsome. Um, at this point, mm -hmm. at this point, <laughs> it, he has to love God. Um, he has to know God. He has to have a relationship with God. He has to be grounded. You know in God and consistent. Consistency is the biggest thing for me right now because um, I can't. <laughs> I've been through it enough in my life where people are just like up and down and consistency will take you a long way with me. You know, it's not about the looks. It's not about how much money he has. It's about does he love God? And if he loves God, I know he's going to love me. If he's consistent in his relationship with God, I know he's going to be consistent, you know, in a relationship with me. So I'm not looking for it. I'm just going to wait for God to bring him to me. Um, but that is, you know, the two main things that I need, you know, that I'm looking for in a relationship. That's awesome. Wow. And I want to go back to something you mentioned about last year, a dark time that you had because I want to learn more about how you overcame that period, because I, I've never had a miscarriage. I can't imagine. I mean, I, I've always, I went to the doctor before, and they said that I would have um, difficulty having children. I'm not at that point yet, so I'll cross that bridge when I get there, but I have faith. But I've never had a miscarriage. So I can only imagine how that can be just another setback. I mean, self-esteem-wise, emotionally, mentally, all that. So can you kind of talk about 
you know, I know you said you wanted to keep that baby. You were really excited about it. And then it was like, man, you know, six weeks in, you lost the baby. How did you deal with that? How did you cope with that? Um, after that one, I had, it was pretty much a deep, dark place um, for me. I went into a really bad depression. Um, I was very snappy, very attitudinal. Um, I felt so incompetent, you know, as a woman. Because it's like, God, all these other friends I have, they're having children. They they don't want their children. And you're blessing them, you know, to have kids. And I can't, you know, have kids. Um, it's just, it was bad. I went and I was actually a bit suicidal during that time as well. Um, and had to actually go through counseling to get myself kind of back on track. I found a Christian counselor and I actually started going to a psychologist. Because I would sit in my room with the lights out, no TV, no anything. Mm -hmm. I barely ate, Terry. I lost so much weight mm -hmm. um, going through that time period. My last check-in when I was pregnant at that point, I was about 165 pounds. When I came out of the depression and I did a check-in, I was about 135. Wow. I would not eat. I would lay in my room, I would cry, I would sleep, and I would just take pills, you know, just to make me sleep, just to make me forget about it. And I remember the last, the last night of it, of that depression, like I took so many pills, Terry, that I felt like I was, like I felt like I was dying. And I text my best friend, I said, you have to help me, you have to come in here, I need you. And he was like, no, you have to fight through this. Mm -hmm. But I sat there and I said, okay, God, okay, so he's not going to help me. You're not going to help me. I'm going to take this last, you know, I'm going to take these last few pills where well, I put more. And at this point, I had took about 15 to 16. Um, and these were excedrins, the 800 milligrams. So you can imagine how my body is feeling at this point. I put the last few of them that were in the bottle in a cup of water and let them dissolve. And I said, Lord, I'm going to drink this and you're going to let me, you know, you're going to lay me out because I'm through with this. I'm ready to go. I cannot. He came in the room, Terry, at the very moment that I was about to drink that cup. And he said, I was so, he was so scared. He didn't know like what was going on with me because I was just acting so crazy. Like, it was almost like I was high and I was, like, going through all these different changes. And he prayed and he just set the, he picked up my phone and he played Break Every Chain. And when he set the phone down, he kind of, like, backed out of the room. And I just fell out crying. Like, it was as if everything was kind of just, like, coming out at that point. Like, cause I never talked about it. I always held it in, you know, people... People didn't know I was pregnant. I was still, you know, going about life. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knew I was pregnant. And I just, it hurt me so bad. But I believe that God has a purpose for it. Now, you know, I can see that, you know, he had purpose. He had plan. Um, because if I would have had, you know, all three of those children, who knows where I would be. I could be a victim of the system, you know. And it's just, I can see it now. But even though in the future, I'm like, Lord, okay, we're going to have to fix this in the future. But at this point, <laughs> you know, I'm just believing him and I'm trusting him that they even conceive that the next time, you know, he brings it to be conceived, that he'll push it through. So, yeah. Girl, wow. you making me tear. <laughs> you tear up. Oh my gosh, Nellie, you are incredible. I mean, that is. God has done so much in your life. I am so appreciative to have met you. And I got to, I mean, I got to hear about what you, your accomplishments. I mean, I need you to brag on yourself right now and talk about the amazing things that you were able to do, you know, despite where you came from. What have you done? I know you have your degree. Tell me else what else, tell me about what else you're working on. Okay. Um, of course, the, the degree was my biggest accomplishment first um, because I got kicked out of school on academic probation mm -hmm. and, you know, I got back in there. It took me six years, but mm -hmm. I did it. Um, 
Wait, Nelly, you gotta say that one more time because I have so many friends out there who are so discouraged because it's taken them a long time, but it doesn't matter as long as you finish. How, how long did it take you? It took me six long years, three different schools, and hmm. I finally finished. But yeah. God did it, but he did that and he showed me something like that I could be a finisher because that's that was another problem I had, never feeling like I could finish anything. So now he's showing me like I can complete things, I can finish things, I can start it, you know, and I can go through it. Like I have the dance team, the dance ministry in my church. Um, they're awesome. I love them. Um, the girls, they push with me, they stick with me, they bear with me, you know. And I actually have two. There's an adult and there's a youth dance ministry. Um, I'm actually working on the summer initiative. I started a summer camp last year for the neighborhood. It was a free camp. It was awesome. Um, and I graduated 10 girls from that program last year. So this year we're bringing it back. And I'm excited about that from July to September. We're going to run that again, the summer camp, the summer camp initiative. And it's completely, completely free. Out of my pocket. I just love to dance. I love to get these kids off the street. They need an outlet. So, you know, God gave me the gift and I'm trying to use it. And of course we have the Lost Cries, the blog. Mm -hmm. um, that blog was started about last year. Um, I wrote in it about two times last year. And then I stopped when I went into, you know, some different things. It's one o'clock. I picked it back up this year and we are going forth with it. God is really like moving and people are reaching out. They're emailing me. They're calling and texting and telling me, oh, my God, I can't believe that you said that. But I've been wanting to say that for so long. So that's why I keep doing it. And I keep pushing in and I keep pressing with that as well. And of course, the big one, the book. Um, <laughs> my first book um, it's almost finished I'm writing a women's devotional a 31 day devotion and um, God gave me the title 31 days to fight fail and recover say that one more time Nelly because we were breaking up I gotta get that girl <laughs> okay uh, the devotion is titled 31 days to fight fail and recover um, so I'm really really excited about that we are almost to the stage where we want to edit um halfway through writing so um god is really moving he's pushing um and i'm going forward you are incredible i'm just so you got me so excited over here i want to know where are you located in chicago in chicago because we may have some viewers who are watching this who want to get their young people involved in your ministry you don't have to give out your address or nothing because you know we got you know but um we got what area, yeah what area and then i'll give we'll talk about your social media handles as well so they can reach out to you personally okay um we are on the south side of chicago um around the chatham area neighborhood where it's a lot going on uh these this is the neighborhood normally the chatham the inglewood area where there are all the shootings are based where all the kids are you know really getting into a lot of trouble so we are like dead smack in the middle and my pastor kind of he, he at first he didn't want to be here but then he was like you know God has us here for a purpose because we're right in the middle of all of this mm -hmm. and God is really you know drawing them in he's drawing them to the ministry because they want something they're looking for something but they cannot find it that's so exciting <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you, you're incredible. You're incredible. Nelly, where can our viewers find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter at The Lost Cries. That's actually my Instagram as well. Um, I am on Facebook, Annette Nelly Cooks um, on Facebook. And I actually have The Lost Cries as a page on Facebook as well. So they can search The Lost Cries and they can pull me up. I'm the only one you know, that has the lost cries on there because people don't know, people don't understand. But when they get there, they're like, oh my God, this really is, this is powerful. This is something. So um, look me up, check me out. I'm excited to connect with people. Yay. And now we got to talk about how we met really quick because I just, it, this was definitely divinely uh, orchestrated, you know what I mean? Divinely orchestrated this whole meeting. 
uh, we met on Twitter, right? Mm-hmm. What's we met on Twitter. Twitter? Yes. <laughs> Look at that. That was only a couple of weeks ago. We met on Twitter. You messaged me, and um, you asked me how I got started with the because I tweeted you the link to my blog, and you messaged me asking me how I got started, and then somehow that is, that Twitter didn't work. So we ended up emailing back and forth. Yes. And from there, like, God just took the lead and mm. brought us here. I'm so excited about this connection, wow. this relationship. Yes, and it's funny because you, you were applying to be a mocha girl on a mission and submitted the form. And I was like, what? She's been through all this stuff. Oh, no, Nelly, we want to talk about that. We need to do an interview. Because was just, well, there was just so much there that I think, you know, women need to hear. So I'm so grateful to have met you. I'm so excited for what you're going to do in life. I'm about to tear up again just because I just, you're a rock star, girl. Like, seriously, you're going to go so far. I'm so happy for you. And um, in closing, I just want to ask you, What's next? What are you planning to do after your devotionals release? What do you want to do? What are some of your long-term goals? Um, I want to travel. Um, I'm looking forward to this book getting published and traveling, actually. being a. My dream is to be a motivational speaker. Um, I want to just go and speak for a living. So I'm praying that God, you know, opens the doors to get me into certain places to speak to the young women to help them because a lot of our kids are dying. You know, a lot of them need to hear that someone has been out of this stuff. So that's my deal to get on the road. I want to start speaking and engaging, you know, the people that I'm reaching out to. Um, and girl, I want to get married soon. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're real up in here. You know, I feel you. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not dating right now, but I'm I'm praying that, you know, as I travel, that Boaz will just spot me out while I'm up speaking. I know. And, right. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll connect. So, yeah, that's where I am right now. And also I'm in, you know, leadership training at church. So um, I'm looking to buy maybe the end of next year, actually elevate to minister and training. So that's really the next step for me, just going up. Can't go anywhere but up. Yes, that's it. That is so exciting. And girl, I have to tell you, offline, I'll tell you about my uh, the company I work with called Cool Speak because we train and, and, and hire speakers that travel across the country. So we got to get you hooked up with Cool Speak so we can get you started on that. And girl, it's funny with relationships. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting. I didn't think I'd be married at 25. Like if you ask my friends, I was like, oh no, I'm Miss Independent. I'll be getting married. Like <laughs> y'all have kids at 35. Like I had it all mapped out. But I swear, when you're not expecting it, and when you're focused and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it just happens. And we end up me and my fiance met in grad school, and four years later, you know, after we oh, dated for a while, we're getting married in July. So I'm telling you. Yay. Old tight girl, it's, it's coming. I believe I'm believing it for you, and I am going to keep you in my thoughts and prayers. And I just want to thank you so much for your transparency and for you just being so so open and sharing your story. We really do need to hear more stories like this. So thank you so much. You are a rock star and an amazing girl on a mission. I'm progress girl. That's my my handle. I'm a work in progress, always. Right. We all are, girl, because I am too. Girl, he's still working on me too. But thank you so much, Nelly. I will definitely keep in touch, and we'll be doing more more of these. We'll have to do some webinars and all that down the line. But thank you so much, girl. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. And there you have it, my interview with Nelly Cooks from the Lost Cries Movement. Nelly is so sweet. She is just such an incredible young woman. Um, interviewing her was just so inspiring for me. She excited me and I'm just so happy to see how far she's going to go. Interviewing Nelly also reminded me of why I started Mocha Girls Pit Stop in the first place. And of course Mocha Girls Pit Stop is a personal development blog for young women, but I started the blog because I grew up struggling with low self-esteem and depression and I didn't see women who look like me on television 
on the internet, I mean really anywhere, talking about the issues that I was going through. I didn't see them speaking about low self-esteem, depression, body image issues, struggling with womanhood and kind of finding out who you are in this world and why you're here, why you belong here, and things like that. So I started Mocha Girls Pit Stop as a place where women can come for motivation and also where they can ignite their lives. So if you're looking for a positive community of women who inspire women, you can subscribe today to the Mocha Girls Pit Stop blog and you'll receive our weekly inspirational email along with free resources for goal mapping. We have a blogger's toolkit for beginners that we have on the blog as well. So I invite you to subscribe to the blog because it will really change your life because it has changed mine. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Stay tuned for our next interview.